Hello everyone. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk about call protection. But in reality, you know, Krishna's devotees doesn't need to know, you know, about call protection. You know, just Krishna says, you know, go Krishi go Rakshavasha Sabhajans. It's pretty enough for them because Krishna says there's no other explanation needs as to why we should do it. Just because Krishna says it, Prabhupada Ji says it, that's good enough. There's no further explanation needed. But I want to bring some different aspects to. Spiritually, we understand there's there's lots of uh, pastimes with the Lord having with the cows. You know, when Krishna's mother wanted him to you know, wear shoes, Krishna refused to wear shoes because the cows never wear shoes. So he said, no, no, I'm not going to put on shoes. And he never did. You know, there's lots and lots of pastimes, you know. And if you look at even more detail, I see that, you know, <laughs> Radha Rani loves Krishna uh, with cows even more than Krishna. So there's a, a pastime. Uh, there was a sur in a that showed up at, in Vrindavan, Adita sur, with uh, in a body of a bull being made. And Krishna killed him. When Krishna killed him, later on in the evening when he meet, went to meet Radha Rani, uh, Radha Rani said, no, you cannot come near me because you did go abroad, you did kill a, a bull. And she was like, what are you talking about? I killed a demon. She said, yes, but you know, he was still in the body of a bull. So you must do paschat, you know, uh, to purify yourself. So Krishna says, okay, what do I need to do? She said, well, go bathe in all the pilgrimage and the rivers and you know, then you can come near me. Well, being the Lord, all of them showed up right there, you know, which happened to be Radha Kundi and Shankar. Later on, the whole story everyone knows. But it just kind of shows how much, you know, the two lords love cows and bulls all together. He was a demon, yes, but he was in the body of a cow. You know, when Indra even, you know, when uh, he caused havoc and, you know, Krishna had to lift the Giriraji on his pinky for seven days, Afterwards, um, you know, Indra couldn't face Krishna. He was very disturbed. He's like, you know, I've committed a great sin, you know, against the Lord. I don't know how to face him. So then, you know, he went to Lord Brahma, and Lord Brahma suggested that you grab a, take the cow with you in the first, and then grab her tail in the back, so then, you know, grab her tail and kind of like, you know, come behind her. So when Krishna sees the cows, he's already soft hearted, you know, and that's what he did. He took Mother Surabhi with him, so Surabhi went and Krishna saw Mother Surabhi coming, so he was like, oh, and she started petting her, and then, you know, Indra came from the back from her tail. He's like, oh, you're here too? And, you know, he's like, yeah, so, and Krishna said, it's okay, don't no, come, come closer, it's okay. So there's lots of these pastimes, spiritually, with the Krishna, you know, uh, coming in the evening, you know, after a long day at, uh, you know, herding the cows in the, in the forest, all the gopis would kind of just stand up on, you know, line up just to see Krishna at that time. His color is already Samala, you know. He's a cloud color. And then on top of that, you know, uh, he's ornamented with Godhuli, you know. So when Krishna would walk behind the cows, all the raj from the, the dust from the cow hoops would go in the air and, you know, sprinkle all over Krishna. So, and it just, he looks so beautiful at that moment. And, um, so there's lots of these pastimes that you guys are very well aware of. And, you know, we see Krishna in all the altars, all the pictures with the cows, you know. So Krishna's devotees really don't need to be preached about, you know, why call protection. Um, and I think overall India, you know, if you go to North India, to South India, we all love cows. Like we, our culture is all based around cows. There's no Indian that I've found says, you know, I don't like cows, I, you know, I hate cows. So overall, we all do love cows. So to Indians, uh, there's, it's not a big task to tell them, you know, we should do call, go raksha, cows, go seva. They're already inclined to do those things. But I want to bring other aspects to it. So one of them is health, okay? Um, we're, we're in big trouble as far as our food scarcity and our food, what we're getting. Um, one of the examples is, so what are our options when it comes to food? 
we have two options, especially in the northern hemisphere. We're living in Canada, so here, you know, we have two options. Either you get conventional food, or you get organic food. So when we talk about conventional, how the food is grown, is grown by uh, synthetic fertilizers, okay, which is artificial means. So basically, I give you an example: um, a rose, right? Everybody knows the roses have a beautiful smell, right? But the roses have no smell here. The reason it, it doesn't have a smell is because it's artificially grown. The nutrients are not there for the rose to make make it smelly. You know, the aroma the rose has is not there. And that's all around in our food as well. It looks like a pepper, tastes like a pepper, but nutrition values are almost nil. And it's because it's artificially grown, okay? Um, all they're putting in it is, is synthetic fertilizers and growth hormones. That's how it's coming, okay? So let's look at option B. Option B is organics, okay? Do you know what's a number one organic fertilizer they use in, in, in vegetables? Uh, right? I thought the same thing, buddy. Probably the, I, thought the, I thought it was a cow dung and you know, that's what, to us, that's what fertilizer is. But no, that is not the case. Number one fertilizer, I'm sorry to say, you know, I want, you know, but that is the fact and that is the truth I'm letting you guys know. It's liquid fish, okay? So liquid fish is the number one fertilizer when it comes to organic foods in Canada. Number two on the list is blood, bone, and meal. So basically, slaughterhouse waste uh, that they dry it up, make it in a powder form, and just give the plants that which is blood, bone, and meal. And that's exactly what it's called. When you go buy these, they're readily available. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is, you have to understand, who's keeping cows? Other than me, right? Who's actually keeping cows in Canada? One is a dairy farm, okay? So how do dairy farms do it? So the dairy farms basically, they have a 300 cows or 1,000 cows, whatever the number is, they all have them in, a, in, a, in their pens collected. They're not letting them graze the land. Mm -hmm. they're, they're in a spot and they stay there all their lives. Yeah. You know, all their lives are not like, for them it's only five, six years, but they live to be 20 years old. So they keep them there and they collect the manure. They have a system, automatic systems that collect the manure. And they spray it on their fields every fall and every spring, every six months, you know, fall and spring season changes, they spray it in their fields not growing food for human consumption. That's just for their cow feed. They need that, they spray that. The next person who's keeping cows is beef. You know, you'll see signs, grass-fed beef, right? People who are slaughtering the cows. So what they do is basically leave the cows to graze and they're grazing, you know, come November, they slaughter the big ones, keep the little ones for next year. So they're in the business, the crop is cows. The crop is not anything else. You know, so they have some land. So those are the only two people that are really keeping cows. They don't have manure to give you. And the cows are grazing, they're you know, doing cow dung and everything everywhere, so they're not able to collect that. And nor, so when, you, when we talk about, oh, they're giving cow manure or things like that, no, no one is giving that. Liquid fish is a lot cheaper, a lot easier to get your hands on. Blood, bone, and meal, a lot easier to get your hands on. That's what they're spraying, that's what they're giving in our food. Even if you go down to Niagara Falls, Leamington area, you see all these big, big greenhouses. You know, why are you putting greenhouses on farmland? Because a corporation, you, know, you have to understand how this business world works. The corporation is like, listen, I'm putting a dollar in, I need a dollar twenty, a dollar fifty back. You know, and, and when you when you start dealing in, in farming, you can't guarantee that. You have a cold night, a frost came in, you know, you lost your crop. A bug came in, you had a disease, you lost your crop. Sun didn't come properly, rain didn't come properly, you know, you lost your crop. They're not in business for losing money. They're in business for making money. They don't give a crap about anything else. Our health does not mean uh, does not mean anything to them. So they do it in a controlled environment to a point where they're saying, we don't even need soil. We don't even need soil. So what they're doing is growing their plants and vegetables on water which is called hydroponics. So they put nutrients into the water, which is a synthetic fertilizers, so artificial nutrients go in the water, the plant takes it up, 
If it looks like a tomato, tastes like a tomato, but the nutrition value is zero. You know, some of the guys that are from back home, wherever other than here, you know, not born here, I mean, either South India or in West Indian, it doesn't matter where you're from. How does, like, ask yourself, how does the food actually taste here? They'll tell you it's tasteless. It has no taste. Back home, the food tastes so much better, right? Because they use cow dung, because they use vermi compost to grow. They do not, and we don't believe in these practices, feeding, you know, uh, non vegetarian you know, earthworms are, you know, the worms that are in the ground. They're vegetarians. <laughs> they don't eat meat, you know. So when you guys are, when these guys' practices are being done, all this fertilizer are going in, they're also killing the bio microbiology which is in the soil. So it's a lose lose proposition for everyone. So we just did a, last weekend we did a show, which is a, a pet expo at the International Center. You know, it's a big, big expo. The International Center, if you guys have been there, they're, they're very big. So we actually took the cows there. Um, so we got a booth there, we said, you know what, we want to take our pets, our cows. Within half an hour, they had us removed from there. We paid for the booth, got a big spot there, and we were very excited to preach about cows. Within half an hour, they kicked us out of there. I said, why? They said, we do not consider cows as pets. We consider them as livestock. Guys were with snakes were there. Guys were with tarantulas were there. Guys with dogs and cats were obviously there. So it's very disheartening, you know. So the Kaliyu entry comes in, if you look at the Shimon Bhagavatam, it's by beating up the cows. Rishit Maharaj sees, you know, a person who's decked all nicely, you know, is killing, beating up a bull killing the cows crying there. So in Kaliyu, Goluseva is not an easy task. It's the governments are against you, um, the general populace is against you, but we have something a lot more powerful, a lot more strong, I think, which is the Vaishnava Ashivat, you know, the blessings of a pure devotee. So my Guru Maharaj, I asked him, how can I please the Lord? He said, Vishalji, you do Goluseva. I was only 10 years old when I came to this country. What do I know about cows? I didn't even know that, uh, you know, cows had to be bred in order to have milk. I didn't know, I said, you just milk cows. Like, that's how good that was. Like, I had no clue, you know? Um, so when I got my two cows, and Mara said that, he, and I said, Mara, in Canada, he said, yes, you go serve cows in Canada. So I came home and spoke to the family. The family said, how are you gonna do that? You gonna do business or are you gonna do cows? And We've been always doing business, we'll do business. So we, we came up with an idea, suggested that, you know, why don't we give donations to the coach office? So we started doing that. That didn't, that didn't sit in right. I don't know, maybe from the inside, it kept bothering me. So I started going to a dairy farm to do some seva here. Um, that's when I realized what was actually going on with the cows. It was very, very disheartening. You know, as as bad as you can think, I would say that's just the first step. Their condition, the cow's conditions in today's day and age is very bad. Like I'm saying, it's, it's back to a point where you can't even imagine. So anyways, we've been doing serving the cows now for seven years, okay? We do have some good news. So after seven years, first as a family, the some of them that, that know us as a family, we thought, you know, we're just gonna do this on our own, you know, we don't need anybody. But now we're realizing, no, it's not good for the cows. And it's not good for the community. So both are in a losing proposition. If we don't open our doors, then we'll compete with them. So we this year decided to welcome people in and let them know what we're doing, where we're at. So right now we have 14 cows. When I say cows, cows and bulls. We have eight girls, six boys. So six are Nandi Maharaj, you know. And there's one big issue, and it's a worldwide issue, even in India it exists. We don't have an answer for Nandis. What are we supposed to do with the boys? You know, one option is you castrate them, right? Turn the, the bull into an ox, you know. Uh, that's one option, but we don't agree to that practice. 
Um, so we are keeping them as full intact bulbs. And um, there's a there's a book on Colony Agriculture Constitution for ISKCON. ISKCON has a book, uh, which is a constitution for Colony Agriculture. The person who wrote that Robert is still alive, and he's based out of uh, Alachua, Florida. And I spoke to him personally, and I said, you know, and in there we allow to call a bull to turn to be castrated and turn into an ox. So I told him an ox, and I don't agree with this. But he said something very nice. He said, Prabhuji, your your bhavana, your your you know, bhav is very nice that you know uh, you don't want to do that. But tell you the truth, people that handle the bulls or know how to handle the bulls don't exist. They're gone. And it's a very sad news, but that is the fact. People don't know how to handle the bulls. They don't even know how to behave, how you should do it. Back home in India, you know, we used to have Nandi Boshalas, a person who would just specialize in Nandis. So everybody had cows, but nobody really kept the bulls at their home. But this, if they had a bull, he had a, a chart. You know, if it's uh, this type of breed, he must be this weight, this height. You know, he had a whole, you know, parameters how that baby should be coming. And then people will give him money, and he'll keep the Nandis, and if you ever wanted to, use his services, you'll go to him, take your cow, or he comes to you, use the services, that's how things got done. So he said, well, you know, uh, people know how to uh, take care of bulls don't exist. So which is pretty sad. But he said, he said, if you think you can, then I suggest you do not. So with his blessings also, then we are not castrating off any of our bulls and we're keeping them. We have uh, 150 acres, so we have quite a bit of land. Uh, we have 60 acre property where we are, where we're keeping the girls and boys right now. And then we bought another property, which is a 90 acres, five minutes away from where we are. And we're planning to put uh, an Andi Goshala on it. But the, the good thing is, so where now? We, we, you know, I've said all these things, but where do, how do we move forward? Where's the good news? The good news is this, is we're gonna go ahead with this. We're not making you turn in any which way. So we're letting cows graze. We're letting cows, when I say cows, cows and bulls. We're letting them graze, live their life. So they're in a happy state. They know they're protected. They know there's no you know, animals of any sort are attacking them, or they have a threat of any sort. So they're living on their life, they graze. They're in a happy state. Also, when they're grazing, they're also you know, urinating and propping their cow down. Into the into the ground, so the so the microbiology, the microorganisms that are in the soil, be it beetles, insects, worms, all these, they're also thriving. So they're enjoying their life. They're like, yeah, yeah, what the you know, they're they're eating very very good nutrition food, so they're very happy. So so it's a win-win situation for both of them. Another thing is for the environment. If you look at somebody who's keeping cows in a, in, a, in a concentrated place and they're collecting the dung, that dung is, gives off a lot, of, a lot of methane gas, which is not good for our environment. Also, the greenhouse gases are you know, tremendously uh, causing climate change. It's, it's a big issue. So when you keep cows in that confined place, it's, it's a losing proposition for everyone, for the cows, for the environment, for the soil, for everyone else. But when you let them graze, everything changes. So milk is not the focus. So we have 14 all together, but we're milking one. So every year we just pregnant one or two cows, uh, so we can offer make boga or things like that. We don't um, pregnant more than that. The milk's for the baby. You gotta understand, but if you are around cows, you know the cows will give you more than the baby can drink because baby only drinks about five, six months, but cow can be milked up to you know, 10, 12 months, it's no problem. So she will give you milk, you will have that. Uh, so milk is not the focus. So what we want to do is let the cows graze and then cultivate that land for human consumption. You know, be it vegetables, be it grains, whatever it is, you know, wheat, whatever you want to grow. You grow food on that. Now that, when you grow food for human consumption and humans eat that food, it will nourish your body. It will give you the nutrients that you need. It's full of rich nutrients, you know? And that's what we need to do. Yes, 
the issue with this is, it's just hard work. You know, but I say, what is easy? You know, raising kids is easy. Going to school, graduating is easy. Leaving your country, coming here is easy. You know, what is easy in life? Describe easy for me. Devotional service is easy. <laughs> you know, nothing is really easy in life, so you can't take the easy route out. So we will, farming is not easy. It's a lot of hard work. But we're willing to do it. But we need the support of the community to come forward and say, Vishal, you grow the food, we will buy it from you. And that's what we're looking to do. It's a farm to table initiative, okay? Everybody wins, the cows wins. We're not asking for donations. We're just asking to buy the products that we're doing. So we started this, uh, this basket system where we deliver to your home because it's not easy. See, people ask me, you know, like, uh, Prabhu, what do you have in the ground right now? Let's be practical. We live in a country, it's a cold time in the country, middle of April. There's nothing in the ground. You know, uh, you can only put in the ground, you know, after Victoria Day, which is, you know, end of May, beginning of June. That's when you start planting. You only get one crop and the winter comes in, frost comes in, and nothing else grows. But we still gotta all eat. We're still eating. Boba is being done. Offering is being done. So buy that from us. Wherever you the grocery people are buying, they're getting grocery from wholesalers, distributors. So we will go there and get that. And give it right, live right to your home. Also, we grind our own flour. Right? We, we buy this special wheat. It's uh, called spelt. So the wheat, you, the atta, whatever you guys get for the chapatis and stuff, is called durum, which is really bad for us. It's not a great kernel to eat. So all these education I'm giving to you guys, I'm going in very detailed. But this is what I want to tell you. Call protection is easy for you guys. That's not, if Krishna's devotees or Indians overall, you don't really need to explain, you know, they, they love cows. And then, you know, we really don't have any options. How many cow, you know, people are keeping cows other than us, you know? So it's a win-win situation. So if you can support us in this basket program, it'll be good, it's $60. There's no gimmicks, there's no extra charges. It's delivered right to your door. You look at it and you say, this is a gem, you know, this person is charging me so much, giving me nothing. Fine, you can go online, you don't even have to call me, you can just unsubscribe. But I guarantee you when you get that, you'll be very happy. And it's a weekly basket, but we're giving you things that you can use on a weekly basis. We're not giving you something that you're not going to be able to use. For example, there might be two fruits, two vegetables, one lentil, maybe some rice, some uh, the grind we grind. Maybe a coriander, you know, or a salad, cucumber, you know, things that you can use on a weekly basis. Um, there's no customization. You can't change. You know, we might give you something else, like different fruits and different vegetables the next week. We're not going to give you, keep on giving you the same thing. So, and we got to start somewhere. We don't have all the answers. We're not Paramahansas that, you know, have all these things written in stone. As we go along, uh, we'll try to tweak it out, what we need to do, and fix a few things here and there. Um, so that's what I think is a win-win situation. Look, I was in Brampton, Brampton uh, a couple, couple weeks ago. We had 35 families signed up just in Brampton. Yesterday I was in Barry, Barry's town. So these are our families, right? Just come. So in Barry, uh, we had five families that came. And hopefully we get some families here as well, I'm very sure. Um, you know, and, but we have to do this. So because, let's say if we have 100, families, 100 devotee families that are buying this. We already have the land. We've already spent the money. We already have the land. 150 acres is a lot of land to grow food. We already have cows. We already have them. There's no more. I don't have to spend money and get cows. We already have the equipment, the infrastructure. We already have these things. So what are we missing? We're just made, missing the community that, you know, that we're coming out and saying, hey, so if we have 100 families, then we can say by the end of May, hey guys, let's plant two acres of tomatoes here. Let's plant, you know, uh, cucumbers here. We already have the customer base. What we cannot do is plant 100 acres, and then hopefully, you know, because all of them come out in August, right? We have to have a system so we're, you know, out of sight, out of mind, type of thing. You know, a lot of people know us, but how many of you actually come to the farm? Is that, you have come to the farm program? Oh, very so, nice. where is it? Where, where so we're only, we're not that far away, Caledon. Uh, it's about 
uh, I would say it took me about uh, an hour at the most. So 60 kilometers, I would say, the farm is from here. Um, so, you know, uh, when you guys come, uh, we have new buildings there right now and all the other things. And we're, that's what I'm saying, we're opening ourselves up. Um, so win-win situations. People come and ask all sorts of things, different things as well. You know, you guys say mother cow, mother cow, always mother cow. Goat is also mother, no? She gives you milk too, right? Goat. You know, she gives you milk as well. You never say mother goat. I said, you know, yeah, because goat can never be a mother. Can never be a mother. And, you know, only when you stay with cows you understand that. I ask people, you know, what's so special about a dog? What is, what, what is one capability a dog has that no other, no other species has? Very good. So we all know there's no one loyal like a dog. Dog is very, very, very loyal to his master. What's so special about a cow? That only cow has other species do not have this capability. Feelings. Sorry? It has feelings, right? Yes, so every being has feelings, but cows have something very, very special. We, no one else possesses this, Milk. which is called compassion, mm -hmm. the motherly love. Yeah. And they truly have it. And, um, and I can explain you why, how. When, let's say, let's give an example. Let's say fem human females are very compassionable, right? They're very compassionate. Yes, they are. But let's say while they're giving birth, one of them passes away and they deliver a baby. The baby survives, but the mother is gone. I've never seen it, but I've, but I've heard um, other females will raise that child, breastfeed it, and live, you know, live his life. But never, ever would, it, would a human female take a pig and put it on her breast, take a monkey, take a dog, and start feeding it. Mother cow does that. A goat would never, goat even if it feeds its own baby is big baby. But cows, I've seen it with my own eyes. Feeding puppies, feeding, you know, in India, you can see those strange cows, you know, feeding other species. Who else would do that? No one else. You cannot take uh, goat's little uh, balls and, and cook your food on it. But cow patty, we cook, we cook all the time. You take the cow dung and you dry it and you cook your food and it tastes amazing. You can take cow dung and grow your food. You cannot do that with a goat. So when we talk about a mother, she's a universal mother. She's not just my mother, she's a universal mother. You know, there's a past time when Mother Earth was in trouble, she took the form of a cow. So I can go on and go on and go on. I don't even know how much time I have, but um, I would stop and I think I've given you guys a very gift of what we're doing, why is this is important, just for your health, and ethics too, you know, ethics is a big deal. Imagine somebody who keeps their baby in their belly for nine months. As females, all you guys know, and males, we know that mommies keep, you know, them in the belly for nine months. And when it comes out, they slaughter that baby in and eat it. Cow does not release milk when, when their baby is not underneath them. So then the artificial, uh, make, give her oxytocin for milk to come down. So they forcefully take that milk. And then they pasteurize it. We're 1.4 billion human beings just in India alone. We don't pasteurize milk. Never did. But here we pasteurize it. Okay, fine, sure. And they give us 2%, 3%. No cream comes on top. They take all the goodness out, add hormones, and add growth hormones. And, you know, that's good. It's artificial. It's not real food. People can't digest milk. Now you see more and more issues. You know, when I turn a grandpa, I feel sorry for these kids. You know, some of the kids here. You have to connect to the land. You have to connect. If there's somebody knocking on your doors right now and saying, hey, look, I'm willing to do this, you must give him support and say, Prabhu, we'll help you in, in doing this in the I don't think it's a losing proposition for anyone. In the future, you need anything. We need cow for marriages, for hovens, you know, simple things like that. You know, even deities in Salvation, we have Nandis in the front all the time. 
they're needed. It's unfortunate today that Nandis, their only function is, is to be eaten. You know, but we're here to change that. We're able to change the world, but at least we'll strive with our devotee families and see how it comes along. And so I humbly request all of us to please support us in this endeavor. And as I said, the only reason I got involved because my Guru Maharaj asked me to do it. You know, otherwise, as a 10 year kid, no, I, I, I didn't know anything about cows. But I know now that this is not my first life that I'm doing this. I'm very comfortable with them. The reciprocation that the cows give me, I know I've been doing this in my previous life as well. So I'll take some question and ask, you know, questions if you guys have. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, one of the most controversial object that we consume as a devotee community is milk. And Srivan Bhagatam explains a lot about it, how if you take milk without the cow, you know, drinking the milk first, there will be certain reactions and so on and so forth. So, what do you recommend at, at this point of time for us? So, so, very good question, Prabhu, and I understand what you're trying to say. So, I had a, a group there at the, at the Ted Expo. So they took the cows away, but we still went and did the Expo without the cows. We were there standing. So we had a group there. They're very, uh, they have 18, uh, they're in 18 countries. So they came with guns blazing, you know, basically. What do you do with the milk? I said, we feed it to the babies. What do you do with the babies? We said, we let them graze. What do you do with the boys? We let them graze. Do you castrate the boys? We said, no. You don't slaughter anyone? We said no. So they all calmed down. And I asked them a simple question. I'm like, how do you plan to grow your food if guys like me don't exist? And they all started looking at each other. They didn't have an answer. They couldn't understand the question. I said, what are you going to do? Artificial and uh, artificial synthetic foods to your kids and yourself? You're going to be sick. You are going to be sick. You know, I, my, my grandfather lived to be in his 90s. And I kid you not, like this guy was not that great. Like my dad, if you know, my dad looks really good. I'm more great than my dad. I don't even have hair, he has full flinches hair. So, you know, it's, it's not normal. But we, it's becoming normal we, because there's so many of us that we think being bald at this age or being gray at this age is normal. It's not normal, okay? So just to answer your question on the milk, Prabhu. Yes, the milk should not be consumed, but, but at the same time, the circumstances have really changed. What options do we have? We have, we're not vegans. Krishna was a makhan chodri, he stole butter, so we're, we're definitely not vegans because Krishna was not vegan. Well, I'm not suggesting to be vegan. But what I'm suggesting, I don't know about anyone else, but you, you personally have an option. Your option is, you have somebody who can do it. We don't have to worry about the world. You know, we're personal individuals. You know, our kids are personal individuals, our wife, we're personal individuals. We're we're personal individual ourselves. So as far as we're concerned, we can provide that option. We've been fighting with the DFOs and the Mafra because all very controlled. If you came to me and you said, Prabhu, can you cut this cow's leg and can I have it? Legally, I can. I don't even have to slaughter her. Just cut her leg and give it to you. Legally, I can slaughter her and give it to you. There's no rules or regulation. Legally, I can grow marijuana on my property. Legally, I can sell eggs, slaughter chickens, no issues. But a glass of milk is a criminal offense. Can you believe that? A glass of milk in this country to get, leave my property is a criminal offense. How can we be okay with that? If you want halal meat, it's provided to you. There's provisions. The government has these provisions in there. If you want halal meat, you'll get it. But if you want milk from a cow that is not slaughtered, the babies are not slaughtered, that is not allowed. You cannot get it. The system is designed to slaughter cows. And we've been fighting with them for three years now. And we're at IT, very high level. The solution would come. It will come. They have to go. You know, it's one thing, you know, messing with normal people, but messing with devotees is, is not, it doesn't go down all, all the time very nicely. Krishna has somehow, he, he gets, gets you hooked. So it will get hooked for sure. It will come through. But till then, you must pray to Krishna, Krishna and say, please, you know I don't want to drink this milk. You know I don't want to make this offering. But tell me what choice do I have? Right? Tell me what choice do I have. So please accept this offering. 
make it sanctified, spiritualize it, and please bless us that tomorrow we can get milk that is the way, you know, way we want it, where the babies are not slaughtered. Please help us. And that's it. And then you contact us. When we have milk, we can give you. When we don't have milk, we don't have to give you. Don't eat some, don't need to overindulge, but I'm not, I would not suggest anybody to go be vegan. No way. No. But I would suggest that you support us when we have ghee, when we have milk. See, here's a problem. You have to understand the problem. How do you put a price to the milk? Tell me what price should I sell the milk for? Half the milk the baby drinks, right? So we don't do artificial insemination. Artificial insemination is $55 injection you can put. We have a intact bull. He eats more, more than, in a week, than $55. You know what I mean? So there's a cost of that bull. Plus, if the baby comes, he drinks half the milk. Then, after that, you know, a cow stops giving milk, she has to live her life. And that baby, if it's a male, he has to live his life. And we're not giving her a very high protein diet. We're letting her graze. So we're, our focus is not milk, or we need to give her protein, protein so much that we need higher, more, more milk, more, milk, more, more, and then she's burned out. You know, imagine your car, you just have a, your, your foot right on the accelerator all the way, you know, whatever speed you can push it to. How long can you, the car will burn out, you know? So it's a very sad situation, but that's how it is. But we have to do something. We cannot just say oh, what options we have. At least, if nothing else, tell other people about us. If nothing else, pray to Krishna. Things will happen. If, 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 if a third devotee has given you an order to serve cows, there must be some kind of a plan, right? That he can see. We don't see, but he sees. So, I would never suggest anybody to be vegan. So you take the milk Prabhu, and you offer it to Krishna, and you pray to him that I don't want to do this, but tell me what options. So either you make it work, you if he can't fix, who can fix it? You're, you're reaching to the topmost first, you know, as high as you can go, Supreme Lord himself. So if he's not willing to do it, then who can? You know, there's a past I want to just quickly share with some people. Um, it's about Hanumanji. In the Ramayana, when Hanumanji entered Lanka, he, Tulsidasji is writing and he's looking at what, what were they eating? And he writes, water buffaloes, hence, they were eating, so Hanumanji says, they were eating water buffaloes. They were eating humans, Manusha. They were also eating Dhenu. Dhenu means cows. What time is this? This is in Dritta Yoga. Lord Ram is this. Who's eating? Who are these guys? So by birth, they're, they're yes, they're karmas are thing, but they're Brahmins. Ram was a Brahmin. And he's in such, you know, that's a, you know, the karma, in, in their karma, yes, he was a uh, Raksha, a demon, he's always described to but these were Brahmins that were doing these things. They were eating all these things. Even at that time, so we don't have to worry about that. We do, we're on the side of Krishna. So we have to do what Krishna is telling us to do. That's how we have to live our life. And, and you know, Krishna loves cows. He doesn't know what's going on. Of course he does. But we have to do our part. Everything has some time, you know. It changes. It's time for the cows to change. This animal is not an animal. It's a divine being. It has to be recognized that way. Does that answer your question, Prabhu? So, I mean, you can supply the vegetables few months in a year. What about the rest of the year? No, so we're, it's a full year, even in the winter. So what I'm saying is, right now, so we're starting this in beginning of May. There's no nothing we're growing in beginning of May. But what I'm saying is, when you're going to the grocery store and buying it, don't buy it from the grocery store, buy it from us. We will deliver to your home. Wherever that grocery store is getting from a wholesaler or distributor, right, we will also get from there. We will get from other farmers, right? We can go to the distributor and get those. And that's how we have to stay connected. You're right, I only can give you a few, few months of the year. What am I gonna do when the winter comes? We need support all year long. The cow has to eat every single day. Every single day, you know, there's two, two services. Once in the morning, once in the evening. It has to be conducted. 
seven days a week, 365 days of the year. It has to be done. So what I'm saying is, no, you get food every week for the whole year, even in the winter. So in the summer, we'll grow ourselves. When, when we can't grow because obviously there's snow on the ground, then wherever you, the companies are bringing their food, we'll go there and we'll bring the food from there, still give it to you. The thing is, imagine if we get to even bigger, like I just said 100, imagine we got to the thousands. If there's thousands of us, then I can even go to south of the border in Florida, anywhere. We can connect direct to the farms there. We can, we can buy land there and grow food in the south and bring it here. It's not a problem. Everyone is doing the same thing. Where do you think we're getting our food right now? Peru, Mexico, South America? Nothing is grown here, let's be practical. Unless it's grown in the greenhouse, which is, again, a big, big profit. But that's what I'm saying. So you will get it all year long. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Sorry, Mother, you were saying. Yeah. Like, uh, how come Ravana, he was a gatekeeper in Vaikuntha, so how come they were eating all those things? Sorry, so your question is, at that time, why were they eating? Yeah, because he was a devotee of the Lord. He was the gatekeeper for Vaikuntha, Loka. <laughs> yes, but it was a different pastime, right? At that time, he was, the Krishna, Krishna had a desire to fight. Jai basically put up their hands and said, Prabhu, we'll do it. No, no. Like, what? Then what are you going to do? Well, I don't know. We'll probably steal your woman. <laughs> you know, it's like they were willing to do whatever it took just to please the Lord. They're pure devotees of the Lord. You know, to, to, to understand by mundane means as, as to how pure devotee works is, is not possible. But if you read the Ramayana, you understand that the intentions of Ravana is very clear, you know, and as to what he's doing. So, why they're doing what they're doing, we have to see what we need to do. That is more important. In all the calm clothes, all the doshas that we have inside of us, that we need to fix in ourselves first. Let's get to that Bhagavad Prapti, let's get to that, you know, the divine being who we are to get to that level. And, and just keep on moving forward. You know, let's focus as much as we can on us. I'm not worried about people that are eating. If we don't preach about protecting the cows, then who will? People who are eating them? No way. But believe me, those vegans that came there, they're coming to the farm. <laughs> At that time, I think I could have even sold them honey, which is <laughs> made by the bees. You know, they were like so inspired. They, they, they didn't understand the concept. They didn't even know what else. They were so baffled. This is what devotees can do, you know. So we're serving cows now for seven years, so it'll be nice. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, Prabhu, you were talking about veganism, uh, but let's say <coughs> all the, all the devotees become vegan, wouldn't that reduce the number of cows being slaughtered and uh, for milk consumption? Yeah, Prabhu, but you have to understand, Krishna was not <coughs> vegan, okay? Veganism, uh, we're not agreeing to that practice. What they're, what they're doing is very good, but again, how do you plan to grow your food? How do you plan to get nourished? If there's no cows grazing on the field, you have to grow your food, right? You gotta eat something. How are you gonna eat? What are you gonna eat? You gonna eat roti, you gonna eat rice? How is it that gonna grow? With urea, artificial means? You need cows, it's a 360 degree. You know, you can't say, okay, basically this, okay. Basically this is what vegans are, to me. They see a problem, they see the issue, the cruelty to the animals and all that. They see all that and they say they don't want to be a part of it. They don't want anything to do with it. A devotee on the other hand also sees the same thing. But he said he wants to solve it. He wants to solve the problem. He wants to solve the issue. So I will take care of the cows. I'll protect them. I will not do cruelty. I will not slaughter them. They will live out their lives. So we're actually solving the problem. This is how it used to be, right? But it all got changed because big corporations came in. And this is going on more and more and more. Right? So, being a vegan is basically saying we don't want to solve the problem. But the problem still exists. See, I'm asking you, how do you plan to grow your food? It's a very simple question, but very difficult to answer. Because you don't, if you don't fertilize the soil, how do you plan to grow? If you, you're going to use, say, let's say you say, I'm going to go with plant-based fertilizer, leaves and things like that. 
the amount of sugar? You know how much mass numbers you need? But when a cow eats and grazing, and how much water you need to grow plants? It's a lot. So veganism, I don't agree to. I'm sorry to say, yes, we're not in a situation which we should not be drinking this one. But we have to pray. And we have to support guys like this. At least you know me. For you, as far as you're concerned, you know us. And there's a lot of devotees like this in the world that Prabhupada's mercy, you know, this is happening. There's a lot of farms. And, and actually, the GBC, the government body of Iskand, it has made it mandatory that deity should not be getting that milk. So the temples have a responsibility to, to approach us and say, hey, how can we get the, the milk and stuff? I think that's it. Uh, anybody else has any other questions? So I'm still here. If anybody wants a basket, please sign up. Let me know. I just need your name and uh, addresses. And we will start delivering, as I said, first week of May. And uh, we'll take it from there. If you don't like it, you can cancel it. But I'm pretty sure that's not going to happen. Did you said $60 yeah. per month? Per week. Per week. $60. Every week, yes. For $60, you know, like, to this day and age in grocery, and we're talking about from flour to vegetables and salads and herbs. There's all sorts of different stuff. It's not much, you know, it's not much for groceries these days. And that's a number that everybody is pretty comfortable with. We've seen that. So, um, thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.